All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes, both the minutes have been approved. Um, we're going to move on to school committee chairperson comments. Um, so I wanted to take just a second um, tonight to talk with the committee about um, some things that have been sort of in a future agenda items for a while, talking about improved communication and improving transparency and some of the work that this committee is doing and then possibly um, having that as sort of a goal with action steps for us. Um, moving forward with this year to see if there's any appetite on this committee for doing something a little bit more formal and open about, about that. I think that'd be great. Okay. So I know in the past we actually had two sessions. Anybody else? <laughs> I don't know if anybody else here was actually that was participating, but those sessions were about the rules. About an educational process that people understood, like what, what is the role of the school committee? What do we do? Why do we do it? How does that function? And those kinds of things. We had that. So the development of the goals coming out of it, I think, is pretty effective. And was that done like a, as a training for the school committee, or it was? was a... I mean, it's an open meeting, but it's mm -hmm. done. It was done as like a training for the school committee to be able to talk about, okay, what does it mean, like. What's the role of the school committee versus the superintendent or the administration or some of the other groups that are there? So, I know the ones in the past were conducted by uh, Joe had a mentor that was out of BC. So, yeah. Is that something where we need some sort of formal motion or anything like that to have that happen? Yeah, somebody can look into it and we can just start to work with it. I'll figure out how, how we schedule it out there. Okay. Any volunteers? I can add to, if you don't mind, that Tracy Novick is our field rep for all of you, so she is willing to come and do workshops that you might want to do either at a it can be at a meeting like this or it could be in a separate workshop style if you want to go through uh, Dorothy Presser as well does it um, she's not our field rep she's always willing to come um, and do uh, goal setting sure. roles with school committees so those are those I recommend reaching out and I'm happy to help too if anybody needs assistance great so anybody want to volunteer I'm happy to volunteer. <laughs> Are you sure, Phil? You got a lot on your plate. No, I am. I don't, I don't even have to. <laughs> Would you like one? <laughs> right. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Um, then I don't have any further comments, so I think we'll shift over to community comments. Um, at this point, with a reminder to folks in attendance virtually and in the room, um, when making comments, we ask that you state your name as well as the town where you reside. Um, we're, we'd like you to limit your comments to three minutes, and once you've spoken, we'd like you to limit it to that one time. Um, and we're leaving about 15, 10, 15 minutes for community comments at this point. Have anybody who'd like to come forward and comment? Okay, see nobody in the room. Is there anybody in our Zoom room? I see nobody raising their hand. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which would be student comments. And we have some guests from Memorial Elementary School who provide us some student highlights. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for having us. We hope that this is a happy time for you in your meeting tonight. Um, we've come to share a little bit about um, what learning math looks like at Memorial School uh, in 2021 and 22. Um, we're going to briefly share with you a little bit about two different um, curriculum resources that we've adopted this year, um, Bridges in Mathematics as well as ST Math. I like pictures in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> Um, so as you can see through these pictures, we're hoping to reimagine how the math class looks and feels while supporting students as they develop strong mathematical skills and develop a love for the subject. Um, in these pictures, you can see already we're just a month in and there's already lots of partner work, classroom discussions, games, use of tools, rigorous problem solving embedded into both of our new um, curriculum resources. So ST Math um, is the first that we're going to talk about. Um, it's a visual instructional program that helps build students' deep conceptual understanding of math through the, uses, through the use of puzzles and games. It kind of feel like a video game, right? Do you agree, JJ? It feels a bit like a video game? Kind of. Yeah. yeah. Um, we received a grant of over $30,000, which provides us with the program for three years. Along with consultation, we have a great rep that uh, meets with me whenever I need her to. She sends me tons of resources. Um, and our, our educators receive um, professional development throughout the school year. We've incorporated ST Math into our students' learning goals for the year with the hope to have each student on average complete 70% of their grade level puzzles by the end of the school year. That's right, maybe 100%, that would be great. Um, so we're trying to build um, some excitement and motivate our students um, to really love to use the program. Um, we have a bulletin board you can see in the bottom right hand corner climbing junior heights with Gigi, and Gigi is climbing the mountain. Gigi is the penguin that um, is part of the program. And as of this morning, I was excited to get our weekly report. All of our classrooms are already at or exceeding 10% of their way through the, through the program, which is awesome. We've only been using it for three weeks. Um, we celebrate weekly Golden Gigi Awards for the classrooms um, in each grade span, K through one and two through four, who um, either average the most minutes per class um, or the most puzzles. And you can see in the upper left hand corner, um, that's Ms. Obi's kindergarten students celebrating. their 170 average puzzles per student last week. Um, and we even have a cute little Gigi that comes and visits and helps hand out our awards. So um, just a little snapshot of that, go ahead. So we're gonna start. Um, this evening, I brought two of our ST Math superstars. This is um, fourth grader Braden Martin. He is a student in Mrs. Brigham's fourth grade classroom. And this is JJ Hasty. He's a second grader in Mrs. Kutcher's class. Um, and we're going to start with Braden. He's going to share a little bit about his experience with ST Math. I was like, who's trying? Okay. ST Math teaches me math and it's fun. You have to do problems and solve them. What keeps me going when I fail is that I can do it again using paper or pencil. And I can and I can learn from my mistakes because it gives me clues. When I get stuck on a puzzle, I use paper and pencil and then I try something and if, if it doesn't work, I can try again. SP Rock is something I want to do with school companies. And so Brayden is truly a superstar in our fourth grade. Um, on the right of the screen up there, that's his, a snapshot of his pro productivity over the past couple of weeks. Um, you can see he's working on fractions, equivalents, and ordering. That's his puzzle set. I think you probably passed that over the weekend, didn't you? This was late last week on October 1st. Um, and you can see where it says this week, this is, that's actually last week. He was average, he accumulated 330 minutes over the course of the week on the app. Um, and completed 228 puzzles. So he really and truly is an ST Math superstar. JJ, do you want to share a little bit about the passport that Mrs. Brigham uses for the Okay, class? the passport. Oh, no, no, JJ, hold on. Braden. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my <bad>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the passport is like the percentage of how much you've done in 
test for that. Uh, uh, ten percent, then you get your passport, and you get a sticker every time you get ten percent. We can make a hundred, three thousand puzzles in total. You uh, you win win SDF. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Brandon, um, have you got your thirty percent yet? Uh, like yes. you were close. Yeah, you got it this week, didn't you? Yes, I got thirty. Yeah. So if you were to look at his passport now, you have a sticker over thirty percent, which is quite impressive. We've only been using the program for three weeks. Actually, Jay, you want to share? Um, you want to share a little bit about your experience with SKMAC? I like video games. SKMAC is kind of like a video game. It is creative, and when you do it, the map, it sends your GG to different places. When I get stuck, I try to count these what I know already. And if I don't know it, I write down what I think it is and try it. I don't feel up. Sometimes I use my whiteboard to help me when I am stuck. I am motivated by SC Math because I like to do one puzzle and be smarter in math. I want to get the one GG award like some of the other questions. GG comes to class and gives me one GG. It's just a, a quick snapshot of, of JJ demonstrating ST math for us. I'm bad at it. He did that first one wrong, so he did that second. Uh, so finally, I just want to share briefly a little bit about um, our other math curriculum resource that we've adopted this year, which is in mathematics. Um, this was chosen for grades K through 5 after a year-long curriculum review with a rather large group of educators looking at many different programs. Um, we were looking for alignment to the standards, alignment to our, our vision for what we wanted from our mathematicians, and Bridges is what kind of emerged at the top. Honestly, I couldn't be more pleased with it. it the stuff that's happening in our classrooms is just absolutely amazing. Um, it is aligned to the state standards, and it's both rigorous, but it's also accessible to all of our learners, which was a really important piece that we were looking for. Uh, students are engaging in problem solving, making connections between mathematical concepts, and developing the ability to solve complex problems. Bridges embeds the use of tools into every lesson to truly help students understand concretely the math that's being asked, that they're being asked to model on paper, um, and then eventually moves them to the more abstract models like equations. I just want to quickly, um, I have the next five slides just shows a picture of each of the grade levels engaging in one of the aspects of the program, and I thought it painted a pretty nice picture of what we're doing each day. Um, so this is our kindergarten, um, one of our kindergarten classes. This was during the first week of school. Um, and they're learning about the numbers one through five by using their, their sneakers, which I think is pretty cool. Um, one of the things that our kindergarten teachers are having to adjust to is that the first four to five months of Bridges does not use a workbook in kindergarten. And that's a real shift, and it's a really great shift because the kids are hands-on building things, building that conceptual understanding of what a number is. This is a, uh, a, the beginning of the first grade work workspaces, workplaces, I can't remember what it's called, one of the two, uh, which is basically opportunities for kids to work in small groups. Um, I think it's really intended for use in small groups while the teacher's teaching a small group. Um, tons of hands-on manipulatives. In this picture, the students are using pattern plots to build shapes and patterns. Um, one of the, the tools that you'll see throughout Bridges is the use of what's called a number rack. It's also it's a bit like an abacus, and you can see it on the desk of this second grader. This was a a lesson on doubles and doubles facts, and they were looking for patterns and numbers using that using that number rack. Um, this is a third grade lesson. Um, it's another workplace um, workplace lesson where they're playing a collaborative game on subtraction. It's called um, Last Off Into Space. Um, Dr. Tong was there when we were observing this, and the kids were really having to figure the game out as they were as they were playing it. As you can see, uh, their work workbook page has the directions, but it's very lengthy. So it was neat to watch them kind of struggle through it. 
And then this is um, this is perhaps one of my most favorite things about um, bridges is the number corner, which happens every morning. Um, one of the awesome things I think is an awesome thing about bridges is that it kind of happens throughout the whole school day. Um, they start their day off with like a calendar type activity, and in fourth grade they have every Friday what's called a problem string, which basically is a series of problems that get progressively more more uh, difficult as they work through them and they have to use what they learned from the previous problem to help them with the next one. Um, and this is an example of um, a fourth grade classroom working through a problem, a problem string one Friday. You can see they're working in groups of four. Um, this was, they were at one of the more difficult problems here. Um, and what I really love is that that's their workbook. And I know you can't see it really well, but the workbook, it's just a big piece of grid paper. So they have space and time and opportunities to really dig into problems. So kind of taking you through the span of the grades. Um, and if you have any questions for us, I know the boys would love to share more if you have questions for them. I have a question. Yeah. So to both Braden and JJ, what's your favorite subject? Is math or math? Well, math. And what's your favorite subject? Okay, maybe science. Yeah. Or maybe math. Yeah, science, that's good. Uh, my favorite probably be like math. Yeah. Pretty good. Why? Because I love just adding because it just seems so cool. It's just like add numbers. Is it really as fun as it looks? Because I got to tell you, that looks much more fun than the way I learned math. <laughs> yeah, it's the way I learned math. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't tell me the place where they told me the place uh, we can, Sam, can you go back to JJ's slide real quick? He wants me to share the number of puzzles he did. Oh, that's right. There it is. So this past week, 131 minutes long and 239 puzzles. Awesome. Yeah, JJ, good job. Really, really good. Good job, really, really, really good. Good job JJ and Braden, thank you both very much for coming and talking to us tonight. We really enjoy it when we have when we have the students come in and talk to us about the things that they like that they're learning. Thank you guys both very much for sharing with us. Thanks for having us. You guys did a great job. Thank you, Brad. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I want the school committee meetings to be all that all the time. <laughs> Okay, and uh, you have a tough act to follow. Should um, <laughs> have uh, changed the order a little bit with this. <laughs> the goal, really, though, with the student updates is to we plan to rotate through, and so that's the first of highlights. We'll have teaching and learning student highlights at each of the meetings at the beginning, and uh, so that's just a little preview of what we'll get to see the rest of the year, but. It's um, a little bit more exciting when you get to hear, hear it straight from the students. Yeah. And uh, I always say that I'm so fortunate that I get to be in all the classrooms every week and I get to see it in action. And um, Mrs. Bell is correct that, uh, you know, the Bridges is just so hands on. I, I was, we knew it was going to be, but we were so surprised almost how much it was right from the start and how engaged the students have been. And uh, they've been really doing a great job with ST math rollout, particularly at Memorial this year too, which is newer for them. So you just you mean rotating through the grades? Yes. When they come in? Well, we'll do different schools, yep. but we'll hit upon different topics. Basically, I'll put it to them of what our some teaching learning highlights so we can get a mix um, across all the schools. Cool. And that's great. How long this is the first year? First year for Bridges. Okay. Yep, first year for that. Uh, we did the full review last year, and so they're still in that phase of learning. That you know, it's a lot. It's, it is a shift in practice for the teachers, but the hands-on materials that go along with it, and the addition of that number of corner, uh, is is great. Seeing the students, and I mean, every time I go through, you see all the things I just mentioned. So it's been great. And then when you add in ST math which is evidence-based and we started to roll that out the last couple of years but really now after you know COVID and the last year where it's been, uh, been, been ramping up and you'll see that uh, periodically in all the visits as well so it's been great. Have 
forgot to ask him though, the big goal is to get Gigi to <laughs> visit the school at some point. So that's our ultimate goal. You tweet out and you share out, and then sometimes we'll get an award of Gigi coming to visit them. Cool. So that, that's, our, that's our personal <laughs> goal that they're working towards. Great. So in a transition to other <laughs> topics that might be on people's minds, but uh, wanted to, I just wanted to give a couple highlights. I know I've shared some info with all of you, but just so everyone's aware of some updates that have come out recently related to COVID. Uh, first, we launched a couple weeks ago the district data dashboard. That can be found if anyone's looking for information related to COVID and um, anything related to schools, new updates from DESE. All of that will be on that website. And it's under COVID-19 resources on, in the menu. So basically, we have to report out to DESE our positive cases every week of staff and students by school. And the, when we report out, I have to report out data from Thursday, the previous week to Wednesday. So I'm just keeping the same order for updates for what, when I update it here in the district, if it makes sense. So by Thursday every week, I'll have updates to that dashboard. So we have a running cumulative data. We have a week by week, which is similar to what we had last year on our dashboard. And I also will put the close contacts and the different levels of it in that information. Uh, I would say that in the last week, we had four students who had tested positive, and that resulted in six close contacts who had to quarantine. Our highest rate so far of a week was our first week of school coming off the summer, but we've seen a decline over the subsequent weeks. So that's been great in a downward trend, so we hope that we can maintain that. Uh, but we'll just keep updating that so we can be as transparent as possible with our internal data as well. This past week, we had an uh, announcement from the commissioner that there was an extension of the mask requirement. I'm sure you all remember that it was supposed to be October 1st. I don't think anyone actually believed that that could happen in the first month of school that they make a, a change. And uh, that was true. They, kept, they extended it out to November 1st for the mask requirements. Uh, I had linked in the uh, information related to the mask requir requirements and also the additional information they provided related to vaccination threshold. So they're still holding to that 80% of staff and students. And the only school that we'd be able to consider do doing that would be at the high school currently. So the next part to share out where we're at, as of this past week, our student vaccination rates for the high school was 71% fully vaccinated. And so that's pulling from actual student data. I know at the beginning of this process, we were pulling from that town data. We now have access to the student data to be a little bit more accurate with that. At the middle school. That's student data or student and staff? That's just students. Okay. We're still in the process of collecting. We put out a survey to all of the staff yep. just to get general vaccination rates of the and I haven't I didn't look today I suppose I could go in and pull it up as of a couple days ago I had about 103 staff members who responded of those that responded 96 percent or so 97 percent said they were fully vaccinated if at the high school we were to move forward to more formally collecting that data we'd have to put in a process based on the <laughs> commissioner what they just shared um, of forms to attest or showing cards and we can develop that system but right now we'd have to have over the 80 percent for the students and the staff to then even be able to consider making any changes if and it would be up to us it's a local decision so we're not required to do it but if we chose to in some districts that are really looking at it are at they're already at 95% of their students, or 90 over 90% of their students. So we definitely want to get as many students um, as we can over that threshold, uh, so we can keep them in school. That's the ultimate. Because if you're exposed, you, you want to make sure that those close contacts are able to remain in school. At the middle school, the data we had so far, so it would be mostly you'd have students in seventh and eighth grade that would be able to be vaccinated. And the rates for our students last time we looked at it was 62% in grade seven and 72% in grade eight. And we did have a few in, who were old enough and that were in um, a small margin in grade six as well. We have scheduled vaccine clinics. We have a flu 
clinic for staff and students this coming Friday from 9 to 11. And we are also hosting a COVID-19 vaccine clinic on October 22nd at NITMA. And we will need to have at least 25 people who would register for that in order to run the clinic. So we'll, um, I've been talking to Leslie and she's been coordinating with um, our district doctor and first parent and the nursing staff, et cetera, to get more information out about that to try to see if we can get enough people to that clinic. So that will help as well. So that's just a little update. Periodically, I'll share out if there are any pieces of information coming from the state related to this. I don't know if you have any questions. We will be planning another vaccine clinic once the, the vaccine is approved for the next age group, which looks like it could happen. Yeah, so absolutely. I think, especially when we are able to expand it, we can see that we'll out. I'm going to move on to the next item that I have, and I'm thrilled to introduce our new interim assistant superintendent, Dr. Cheryl Kirkpatrick. Cheryl, you can come on up to the table so I can say lots of really nice things about you. <laughs> uh, we had about 20 applicants for the position, and of the four finalists, Cheryl rose to the top for our committee very quickly. With over 25 years of experience working in and with public schools as a middle school social studies teacher, researcher, school and district administrator in Boston, Lowell, and Chelmsford, she brings to Men and Upton a diversity of experiences that have focused on building cultures where students and educators thrive and grow. She holds a master's degree in teaching and administration and a doctor from Harvard's Graduate School of Education, where as a research affiliate with the project on the next generation of teachers, her research focused on teacher engagement. She's passionate about facilitating professional learning to help educators access innovative ideas and methods that will positively impact their students. And she has led Lowell's Leadership Academy, taught graduate level education courses at several universities, and supervise educator, mentor, and induction programs across three districts. Additionally, her work as a data inquiry coach has helped principals and teachers assess their instructional strengths and areas of the curriculum that need more attention. She's been serving in the role as director of personnel and professional learning in Chelmsford for the last five years, which she has been involved in overseeing education or evaluation, mentoring and induction, as well as coaching school leaders. While she has enjoyed that position, she's looking for a different opportunity to re-engage with curriculum and instruction and for her passion for supporting administrators and educators. So I'm really excited to have Cheryl joining the team. I know she brings, as I just mentioned, a wide array, a range of professional experiences, a true depth of technical experience, and skill sets such as data analysis, also a lot of experience in human resources, which will really round out our district leadership team. I know you're going to find her to be extremely hardworking, thoughtful, approachable. We've already seen that, and in a position really to hit the ground running as soon as she's able to start. Her official, she's in the transition phase right now. Her official start date is October 18th, but she's been already starting the transition with, with about four days uh, between now and then just to meet with principals and employees. So, with that, the show just to say hi everybody. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm thrilled to be here. Cheryl Kirkpatrick. I'm looking forward to meeting each of you, your students, your constituents, and getting to know the community here. I'm especially excited about diving back into the work that's really made me passionate about spending the last over a quarter of a century uh, uh, working with public schools, and that's to make sure that there's excellent instruction for all kids. And I think the way to do that is working with passionate adults, and I've already been introduced to lots of people. And I feel very fortunate to be a part of this team. I'd like you to know I jumped at the opportunity to be considered for this role. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Maureen several years ago through the Assistant Superintendent's Leadership Program. And uh, uh, right away, I noticed that she was a leader that was extremely talented and uh, that I'd be thrilled to be working with and could learn from and grow from. And uh, I'll be looking forward to working by her side in the service of your communities 
And I want to make sure that you know that my door is open, that uh, reach out to me with any questions or resources that I can help you with as you guide and do the very important work of guiding the public school district in your communities. So thank you for welcoming me. And uh, I look forward to um, actually even starting my tours of the schools tomorrow, even though I don't start until the 18th. So <laughs> I'm not eager. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. I was, I was uh, scrapping my brain to kind of think of a, a tactical question to ask because this is obviously not an interview, but just to get to know you more, um, what what are what are the most passionate things you have? What are the what are the things that give you the most energy when you when you come to your job or working So I I love working with folks in the service of uh, helping kids grow. And so the places that I've had the most joy in my professional career have been where I've been able to um, work with adults who that's their passion as well. And I've been fortunate to be in a role uh, over the last, not even just five years in Chelmsford, but before that in a role, where I've been working with principals and curriculum coordinators and uh, really providing like coaching in that regard, and also directing professional learning for, for folks in that regard. What I'm most eager about getting back to is being in the class with these folks and working with the kids and seeing that energy, and that's what what brings us to this work in the first place. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Besides working with Maureen, she's pretty fabulous. Is there something about our district in particular that was appealing to you? Yes, actually. Um, first of all, the idea that it's regional and there's two communities that need to come together and work together and for the um, sake of the kids. Um, it's small. And I do think that in a small district with my uh, variety of experiences that that would come in, that that would be very useful here. Uh, because in a small district, administrators wear many hats, and I had to wear many hats. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to sharing that with the district and to working with this team that I've already had the pleasure of being introduced to at the district leadership team meeting last week. Thanks, John, for coming in. Looking forward to Well, I look forward to many more interactions, and thanks for having me. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Sure. Finally, my last, and I am really excited that she's here. I just wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> she's already like, so give me this. And she loves data analysis. Yeah. She doesn't always lead with that, but with her, one of her skills. So there's a lot. I'm excited. Um, so then the last agenda item, I just wanted to touch base regarding a student representative to the school committee. And so I had, I've been working with John and Marianne just around maybe um, revamping the role that we've had. It's kind of an opportunity where we have an empty seat for a student to participate on the school committee. Um, seen it done lots of different ways. I always joke back to back when I was in high school and I actually was the rep on the school committee and I kind of forgot that and uh, you know came back and you know I didn't do much in that role to be honest but uh, I have seen it in different districts done in different ways so I did a little research just to see what is the expectation what are the parameters for and there's actually mass general law where we're recommended to have a student rep who then was elected from an adv advisor group, a quickly student council at the school, who would then be a liaison between the school committee, but also a voice for the students as well. And one thing that's really important to me is just bringing the student voice to the table and providing as many opportunities for them. So what we're, we put together, I linked it in there, just kind of draft language, we want your thoughts on that. But basically, I'm gonna put a letter out to the community, to juniors and seniors uh, for one position. I mean, you could consider having two if you wanted some, but I was thinking the first year, maybe we want to just have one, and then we can consider that at, at some point in the future, because sometimes you have rolling a junior and a senior, and then they do it for the two years. Uh, but with that, I'll put a letter out, ask for applications, and then based off of how many would put in for that, 
then there would it would go to the student council or student body and that's what's done in the area and then there would be an election and so within a month hopefully you would have a candidate come forward. So they would do it uh, like similar before we have a, a NIPA, you know, student update, but then anytime we had conversations we'd be kind of saying do you have anything to share, any questions. So being an engaged member, so it's really an opportunity for them to engage in local politics as well. And, um, and share information with them. They wouldn't be a voting member um, that they can't be, but they'd be able to contribute to and participate even in some subcommittees. Let's say they're looking at the budget, they could have the budget meeting, or policy. they could do that. So it really, it's um, you know, whatever we want to make it to be, but they would stay the whole time. So that would be the different expectation about them not getting presentation of info, then um, they would be part of that committee. So I didn't know your thoughts on that before I sent the email out to students. I think it's a great idea. Sound good? I yeah. Too. I would want, I, I think it, we should be clear to the students on what the time commitment is. Yep. Yeah. Um, so they understand like, what they're yes. signing on for. Absolutely. <laughs> Any other comments, thoughts before I send it out? Thank you. That's all I had, and then we have two presentations from some members of the leadership team. So, Dave and Joe. We brought props. We didn't bring kids, we brought the problems. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, the kids were here. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah we didn't, just didn't want to follow them. <laughs> awesome. Hi, everybody. Um, so, for Eric's benefit, I'm Joe Lakey, I'm the director of. Uh, technology operations, Dave Quinn, you've met a hundred so, times. Yeah. Um, just wanted to give a, in your background notes, Maureen mentioned that we just received a grant uh, from the federal government regarding uh, its I mean, main uses for laptops, tablets, and internet connectivity. Um, we the whole thing came out of a seven billion dollar congressional approval uh, that was dispersed over the summer and picked up by a group called USAC, which manages like our E-rate funding and stuff from the federal government. Um, over the summer, they sent out some guidance on how we could apply to use some of those funds. That's where we started to see options for devices and internet access for households that didn't have adequate internet and other possible uses. At that point, Dave and I kind of had a little caucus before summer break and decided to see where we could, if and where we could use some of this money and kind of crafted a little plan and an application and put together some information about it. Uh, a couple weeks ago on the 24th, we got a, a notification letter saying that we were approved. Um, on our application, which we were really excited about. Uh, Dave will go into the numbers and explanation and uh, where we got to the numbers and how we, how we picked what we picked. Um, but it was really exciting because, you know, we weren't really expecting we were going to get the money, uh, let alone we were in the first round. <laughs> so it's really exciting. So we're kind of at the front of the line, which is great for the Apple ordering process, just with the kind of slow down of materials moving around these days. It's kind of nice to be in the front of the line. Um, so there will be some equipment we're ordering mainly for students. Um, there is some teacher hardware included in this. Dave will explain that as well. Um, so with that, Dave. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, just to piggyback on that. Uh, so the federal government looked for this grant to help address what they're calling the homework app. Um, which is a two-part problem. You've got students who don't have access to internet, and we've done numerous surveys to show that, by and large, the families in this community uh, have access to internet. Um, 
and last year during the pandemic, and then even when we had to go out last March, um, we worked with families, teachers, and guidance counselors to identify those that need. Those devices you actually see in front of you are uh, cellular enabled devices, so we had a handful uh, of devices that were able to uh, just connect anywhere in the community. Um, and so the other component is uh, ensuring that students complete their digital work at home, and, and that requires a device. And one of the things that we found from surveying families last year is that while there may be one device at home, there, there's not an ample number of devices for all the students to have access to uh, a device on demand as needed to complete their work. Um, so between surveys and then um, through this grant, we, we were speaking with students, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, we put together an application and you know it's joe was saying that we were not only the first round but there was about five billion dollars worth of requests to the first round of funding only one billion dollars were funded so far if you were part of that that small group that was was i think it, it speaks to you know joe's expertise from doing all of these different rounds of uh, e-rate submissions so that way we could craft a narrative that would be compelling to get this is funded uh, because what this really addresses is that uh, our secondary iPads that were students borrow, I believe, were about between 85 to 90 percent of students borrow a device from the district, are now in their fourth year of use. And so we're now starting to encounter battery outages, delays, they're, they're kind of dwindling down to their, their end of the way. Um, and that was one of the things that we had when we were talking to the students, and one of the reasons why we qualified is that. Um, the grant provides the opportunity for you to replace devices that have aged out um, that were you know, three years old, and our devices are now here for um, So what we did was we, we pulled from our champ management to see how many students had school-issued devices. We put that into the quote. Uh, we also have uh, devices that we'll be providing to our paraprofessionals' laptops so they can support uh, student learning uh, both in the classroom and then we don't ever have to go remote, but um, they can provide additional supports there as well. Uh, so we're really excited uh, when we did the iPad refresh. I don't know if anybody was on the committee when we did our last round. Um, what you see in front of you was what my dream was for students because um, it looks a lot like a laptop. Uh, so we've now got a keyboard, but we keep all of the functionality of the iPad, the digital media creation, the dual cameras, the audio software, the editing. Um, and what we really like about the Apple products, and I know, I don't know, no, no disrespect to the, sure, the, sure. the excellent Dell products, is that we also get quite a bit of uh, residual value out of these devices. So for four hundred and twenty-nine dollars per unit is what we will be charged. That includes the case, the device, and two years worth of Apple Care, uh, which means that they uh, there's no fee for breakage the first two years. Um, and we expect them to have you know. $1,500 worth of residual value by the time we're done, um, which helps keep us. So we're very excited about this. We still need to craft a long-term plan of how to keep this program sustainable. We just want to be thank. We just want to express our gratitude uh, to the federal government, the local state government, uh, and to you know the taxpayers who made this this resource available. And also, I think it demonstrates our, our continued commitment as a district to find funds beyond just the scope of the operating budget to supplement. The type of education. So, uh, any questions? So, nobody said the total amount. Four hundred. Uh, how many devices? How many dollars? Dollars. Four hundred eighty-eight thousand. So that's really impressive. Right? Yeah. So that, that's an amazing feat. It really is. And that's that. Um, that expenditure has to take place over the next two or three years. Uh, one year. One year. One year. Okay. So I've got to get it spent. So we've already been in contact with Apple. Apple is very supportive. They're also talking to us about professional services to help our teachers. Um, you know, with the, I mean, our teachers are familiar, but it's always good to have that actual support for people who are at the cutting edge of what these tools can do. So, uh, really great job. It's so, amazing. It's like uh, 488 grand is a huge amount of money. Yeah. In, in perspective for what the budget was going through, that's a gigantic sum. So that's really impressive. Thank you very much. I mean, it's great to have this award. So, how does it impact your refresh process and cycle? Is it probably going to kind of like a, either a quarter, a quarter, a quarter every four years, or we were on a third, a third, a third? Because that's in the budget, I thought. So, we buy annually for the fifth grade. And then, uh, because they're typically the income, we didn't have to do that this year because the fourth graders had their devices from 
uh, the COVID year. So we, we did buy for the kindergarten. Um, in my time that we've been here, we've done one refresh overhaul, um, and that took care of uh, grades five through 12. And the, uh, that was paid for, you could probably uh, illustrate more. I was paid for out of iPad revolving, uh, partially funded through the residual value of the prior devices. And, and so now with this approach, how much residual value will we get out of the existing devices? We're hoping somewhere in the $100 range, given the age of the device. Condition always plays into it, you know, the, how badly they're banged up. Yeah. I mean, I totally understand. So we, we, we use a third party remarketer that'll go through and buy the devices back. So we usually spread it around through several vendors. Yeah, and there's a few buyers out there that usually will buy them back, mm -hmm. and then we'll get a quote. We'll go with whoever gives us the best price. Mm -hmm. And that money, we usually put that back into the revolving account to offset costs for repairs, extra devices, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. So you didn't do a refresh. You don't do a refresh in ninth grade. No, not the way the the budget is currently structured. We did a refresh of the entire fleet. Um, in Twenty. Okay, so this is so one three cycle devices when they come into high school. They so they carry them with them. Yeah, so so the device calls the student. Yeah. Call the student. Okay. So what are we thinking will happen to that refresh cycle or approach with this purchase? So it sounds like we're going to replace everything that's in sixth through twelfth grade. Essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, what I think this really does is it buys us time to have an informed discussion about how we want to create a sustainable. Uh, funding plan. We will come up with a, a technology plan that will have a proposal for how we, how we believe, but yeah. ultimately it's up to the committee to decide how they want to allocate the dollars. Great. Well, on that one. Oh. <laughs> no, great. I, I mean, I know you guys, you guys have made a lot of magic happen over what you have, what's there, and what you've been able to do. I know it's a combination of grants, I know it's a combination of budgets, I know it's a combination of other people stepping up and helping you, not only you know, the work you are doing a lot. Steve, cool. I appreciate it. Some other guy over yeah. there. Yeah. Yep. And, the, and Felipe, who's on here. Yes, you're mm -hmm. leading it, so I thank you. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How quick does it feel? Or you don't know. Right? <laughs> 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 Just adding to that before you go on, we have never really had an operational cost of the budget for the iPad. We've always sort of done it through one-time money. Yep. It's, it's just, you know, every time it's come up, we've been, been able to come up with money through something. Last year was, you know, we bought 1,200 iPads through money from two towns. This is another 1,200. It gets everything basically in the same model. Cycle, but we've never actually had a recurring cost bill in the budget. Right? No, I do. I do recognize that. Uh, I think, and we need to, you know, going forward, we need to start to build that in, like yeah. we do with the MacBooks and the desktops. I think, it's, I think when we look at that technology refresh approach, and then we got to make sure we have that land in there. I think we we come across years, and you know, one year it'll pop in where you know we're replacing this many iPads, we're getting this much money. One time it won't be maybe for the next year or the year after that, and it'll pop back in again. Right. Your point, you know, as we ran into the pandemic, it was utilizing specific grant money to the town. They kicked in uh, to basically fund purchase of iPads for all the kids that didn't have one. That's essentially what it's going to be. That was great. Okay. Hi, Jay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> How are you tonight? Good. This town over here. All right. So, the long awaited H turner that's called the FY21 closeout. It's finally taken place and it's done. Um, I'm just going to go over quickly. There's one, you were shared a lot of documents. I know a lot of files. Those are all the files that I have to file with the Department of Ed or the Department of Revenue to close out the budget. I tried to sort of put it into a one page highlighter of the various things. We did finish fairly strongly last year, much better than I anticipated. Probably in January and February, when we were in, you know, producing our budget which is gonna help us going forward. So we finished with an end balance of about $917,000. Um, I've said over the years, many times, my goal was always to finish with 1% of the budget not spent. That would be approximately $380,000. So we obviously did much better than that last year. There are several reasons why 
Um, I've highlighted four different accounts that had substantial savings in them. The one thing I didn't highlight that I should have is in addition to this, we received an additional 120,000 circuit breaker reimbursement that we got in June. So that helped offset the out of district tuition and put it into that kind of position. Um, these are accounts that typically I see surpluses in as the year goes on, but certainly you would never build your budget based on the fact that in January you see that there's money in an account. You would want to wait until June when it closes out. A lot of these vendors don't bill us till July for a lot of these bills, so I never know where it's going to end until generally the end of July, which is obviously too late for anything else. Um, but we finished fairly strong there. We also, um, I, we may have talked about this a year ago, we had negotiated with Telstone and Sons a reduced rate for transportation for regular ad based on the hybrid model. My anticipation is that if we go back to the full contractual costs once we return to in school fully, he didn't do that. He left it at the reduced rate for the rest of the year. That saved us you know, $196,000. Health insurance, health insurance is one of those accounts I typically try to budget an additional seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars just to anticipate potential changes during the course of the year. So there is always some, you know, what I call protection in that account because things do change. People, you know, get married, they go on a family plan, they switch to a PPO for a variety of reasons. They take our plan where maybe they were taking their spouse's plan previously. All that can impact stuff, and you don't know that in January, and February when you're building the budget. But we had also had some people that retired and went from retiree, you know, full accounts like you know health insurance based on being employed to going to Medicare and the reduced plan, which is pretty dramatic in savings. I mean, on average, a family plan right now costs the district about twenty thousand dollars. If it's a PPO, it's more like twenty-eight thousand dollars. So it's pretty substantial if you had two or three people that say dropped out. You're talking, you know, eighty thousand dollars right there. Um, so those were some of the bigger savings accounts that helped us quite a bit. Um, lots of other accounts when you go through the whole, you've got a year-to-date, final year-to-date expenditure, you'll see lots of accounts that ended up with surpluses and lots of accounts that ended up in deficit. They all balance out in the end, and that's part of what I have to do is monitor those on a regular basis. But I feel like we finished in pretty good shape. Um, <coughs> The other documents I shared with you, one of them is the end of the year report, which is an Excel file. You have to look, you have to download it as an Excel file. You're not going to be able to see anything any other way. In that file, there's a reports tab that gives you some historical data. It is where uh, the Department of Ed gets all of its data for, for pupil expenditures, all of those various things. They have teacher salaries in there that we report. So there's a lot of data in that file uh, that if you really need to fall asleep at night, you Go through it all and read it. It's Which one is that called? It's called it's EOI. It's uh, EOI 21 is the name of the file. Right. Um, the rest of the stuff that is in there are all things I have to file with the Department of Ed. I filed all this stuff last week for END certification. Typically, when I do this for a week, I get inundated with email questions. What about this? What about that? I've heard absolutely nothing except one email saying you put this in this line, you should put it in this line, just fix it and then resubmit it. So I'm hoping that means, either that means everything's perfect, which is what I'm going with in my head right now, <laughs> or they haven't gotten to it yet because they're busy doing cities and towns, because cities and towns need to be cash certified so that they can finalize their fall town meetings and they will put cities and towns ahead of regional school districts at that point. Um, at that point, is there any questions on the stuff that you were shared with or any questions about how we finished up? Or so so just, to, just to clarify, so when you report this, this information to the state, it ends up going into their per pupil expenditure reports that yep. are up on the website. Yep. So we should be able to be able to see all this information exactly reflected. There. I would hope so. Yeah. Anyone who wants to see that. Yes. Public information totally transparent. Yep. It's all there. Yep. Um, it. I will tell you. So one thing I have noticed in the last week is the Department of Ed has revamped their website. Everything that I knew where it was, I can't find it anymore. Yeah. So I can't guarantee. I mean, yes. Yeah, it is all there. How you find it is another story, and I don't have a good solution for that part. So, have you have you reflected? And and please, if you say no, that's understood, right? Have you reflected the categorization of the state's um, budget categories in our own budget? So, all of the categories and the numbers associated with finance categories. Um, so, let me see if I understand what you're asking. <laughs> Actually, and I talk about there's, this. They're this like accounts, but they're really budget categories. They're not really account. Right. So if you look at our account structure, you'll notice that every every account starts with either one thousand, or two thousand, or three thousand. 
1,000 is the general fund. You know, 2,000 are revolving accounts, 3,000 are grants. So you'll see a 1,000, then you'll next, you'll see a zero, 01 or a zero, 02. One is regular ed, two is special. The next four numbers, like say 1410 or 2210, those are the functions that the state puts out in order to report this data. 1,000 series is administration, 2,000 is instruction, 3,000 is other student, you know, other activities, 4,000 is maintenance. So they had this structure built up. I'd say maybe four or five years ago, I sort of restructured our entire chart of accounts to make sure we were in compliance with this week. When this was all put together and we started with the software, it was not set up the way I think it should have been. So I tried to fix it because I knew this was an opportunity. Uh, so yes, everything that we report was lined up exactly where it is. Now, following that along though, sometimes you'll have a, you know, a bill that comes in that could be an instructional cost or it could be a main, you know, it could fall in different categories. And it's a, you know, we basically do purchase orders, but instruction is pretty easy, right? But let's say it's a building maintenance, but is it heating of buildings or is it boiler maintenance or is it general maintenance? There are a variety of categories. So you kind of have to pick and choose where you go. Um, when I do that end of the year report, they require us to report instructional costs in all the 2000 series by building, not just you know, we spent, you know, 2305 as teacher salaries, not that we just spent this much on salaries, but how much was at MISCO, how much was at Memorial, how much was at Club. So that's part of the, the process of pulling that over together. But yes, okay. uh, that's what you were asking. Yeah, right? that is what I was yes. asking. Yes, excellent. Thank we're you. lined up exactly the way we're supposed to be now. And the, the percentages of spend, I noticed that they have that on the, it looks like a, it looks like an amateur kind of auditing chart is what they have up online. Uh, to, to check your district's percentages of expenditure against the state average and against the, uh, the expected averages for that year or something like that. Yeah, so I can't tell you that I've actually okay. looked at that. That's, so. that's in the same for people expenditure okay. sheets. And so. Yeah, I'm not always a huge fan of some of the things the state puts out, like you know, average teacher salary or even per pupil expenditure, because there's so many variables that can change that that don't really reflect in what you're actually doing as a district, you know, right. instruction-wise. Okay. You know, Average teacher salary, for example, you know, if you have a young staff, your average is less. It doesn't mean you're not providing. You know, it's got nothing to do with anything except you have a bunch of teachers that are in step one through six instead of everybody at top step. Like we're a district that we are fairly so top. Step I don't know. Step. I don't really know how prevalent this is in the communities, both men and men, right now. But I am getting a lot of questions from people who are examining numbers at the state as well as the budget numbers of the town. So they've been curious about how the numbers in the school fit into that and how that whole process goes yeah. forward. So they, they're asking to be educated about it. So if, if we could have just a simple session and, yeah. and see, I mean, you put out a survey to see who would want to attend something like that, because it is going to be a little bit more finance than people are used to. Um, yeah. But at least instruct them about how the budget is, is formed and where our responsibilities are terms of the budget, the timetable for how we report, so that people get an understanding of exactly how the budget is put out. Because I think there's a lot of mystery last year and people got really confused. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. Uh, you know, it does, does need to be understood that city and town budgeting and school budgeting is different than regional school budgeting where we're a government unto ourselves, so to speak. But eventually it all comes together and it's the same. And I, I, I have told people for years, I've been doing this a long time in this position and I was in your seat as well. If anyone wants to ask me a question, I'm happy to sit down and go through everything, right? You know, not that I have a, an abundance of time just to, to do stuff. But. Well, the particulars, that's that's most welcome. Right. Uh, but but um, I think I think people need a bigger structure, an understanding of how it all fits together, right? And then they can start drilling down into the line items that they think might be out of line. You know, right. and you, you guys all know this. We use an Excel sheet for our budget planning, and that sheet is broken out by every single account has a page where it is then itemized what's in that budget. And that's what I use during the course of the year. One of the things that will happen is sometimes, I pull out a year-to-date report and look at accounts probably two or three times a week. If I see an account that's over budget, my first question is, what did we pay for in that account? Especially, let's say it's this time of year. What did we pay for in that account? And did we have it in the budget? Something's wrong because we budgeted correctly, so if it's gone over, we didn't Get a bill to a wrong account, or something else came up that I didn't know about in January, but I try to figure out what is the cause of that. Obviously, I look at the accounts that I see red in more than I look at the accounts that I see surpluses in because 
those are good ones. <laughs> you know, but I do this on a regular basis during the course of the year. Um, I mean, I just did it the other day with this year's thing to find something that should have been charged to a different account. And it's just, you know, that happens. So uh, that's, well, that's part of the process. That's very much appreciated. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate everything you're doing. Thanks. Other questions? So if I look at the closeout of the master account file, so yeah. you're saying there's 917 left? Yeah. It's after closing all the pieces and basically application of server breaker. That yes. number in there reflects the server breaker taken out already. Correct. And then the, the additional 100,000 on server breaker will be an incremental to the one for the 917, or is that included in the number? No, it's included in the number. So, so what circuit is, breaker, when you get extraordinary relief like we did, I think. Circuit breaker works on a basis that you can carry it over for one year. So bottom line is we, whatever we get circuit breaker in this current year, FY22, that is our revenue for FY23. So we have a fixed amount we know when we do our budget. Extraordinary relief doesn't work that way. You have to spend it in the year where you receive it. So you find out in June you're getting 120,000, you've got to apply it right then. So it's uh, out of district tuition, which is the account that we apply it to. It's reduced by that amount. So we do a journal adjustment to transfer expenses from the operational budget to the circuit breaker revolving. So that means we've just gained an additional hundred and whatever thousand dollars in revenue funding. Yep. In the current year, right? And so what if I look at this number, the 917, how will that then flow through into our EMP? Uh so that's part of um, if you look at um, I don't know, you want to go and look at one of the uh, I can show you how that sort of revolves out one of the files. Let me figure out which one it is. Um, I think it's called the combined balance sheet. And you go to the very last page of that, um, of that report. So yes, it's called combined balance sheet FY21. Go to the very second to the last tab of the very last tab, which is all the way in the back, and you'll see what's called the undesignated fund balance rollover. So, a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, there is no account. Probably, you know, it's not something that the Department of Revenue asks wants you to do, um, but they do certify an amount. So you have an undesignated fund balance. You basically start with what you had for the previous year, which for us was one million six hundred fifty-five thousand. You take out any, or you add in anything that you've got reserved for some purpose. You take out anything that you've got reserved for some purpose. So for example, we appropriated six hundred thousand for the FY twenty-two budget that gets taken out, um, the bond premium, then you add all the revenue, add all, you know, subtract all the expenses, and that's your new amount. So that 917 is what was left in the operational. Yeah, okay. So that, that sheet sort of tells you how it calculates all that. That's the sheet they basically certify. Right, well, and now what will happen then, and this is a part that I don't always get, is they're gonna say, okay, that's what you have in your general fund. But let's say you have an account in one of the revolving account that has a deficit of, for example, last year the cafeteria account finished in deficit because we basically had an entire year in FY20 where we paid salaries and had no revenue for it. They subtract that from Ian from your certain undesignated fund now before they certify E and D, even though it's a separate thing, they take that out. So for a while there, we used to get a bill in June for health insurance for July. We pay it because it's due July 1, and then we would move that expense to FY21, you know, the next fiscal year when the fiscal year opens. In the meantime, it shows as a prepay, they take it out of easy. Cash, so, cash versus p &L. Yeah. So what we ended up doing, and, you know, we really have a little bit of leeway is we set, we cut that check now in July 1. Uh, kind of a little bit of a, you know. That's why I said e and is a fictitious thing in many ways. It's much more important to look at your designated one. That's the number that matters. So, and I expect it to be around 1.8 million. Could be a little bit less if they decide they get us for something. That's what they call it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you. I, you know, I felt pretty good about how we closed things out. I thought we did, you know, finish in pretty good shape. We had a lot of help from money from the towns, from grant money. Or, you know, hopefully similar shape this year with some of the grant money. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. How does that, I mean, I assume that that $488,000 for the grant is, it's, uh, it's it above and beyond what we, we expected to spend. Yes, but we didn't budget for that, so we weren't right. going to buy 12 exactly. that to start. So with. that's like a gift. It's going to help us for FY23. All of this is going to help us for FY23 yeah, because, yeah, you know, my goal is 
we need to be able to find FY23 and not have to hit towns for overrides. And I believe we can do so because we finished so strong in FY21 that we can use those funds to help offset the assessments to the town, which is what we're supposed to do with them, to make it more manageable. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. By the way, just so you know, Dave and Joe are my new BFFs right now. <laughs> <laughs> it may change in a week and it might be Cheryl, but we'll see for now. <laughs> Want to get rid of that old thing, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just got this. I like my thing. Unless you want to give me a deal on that. I didn't know. I might be only hold out for windows in this <laughs> Okay, um, moving on to school committee uh, subcommittee updates, starting with our budget subcommittee. We're going to meet tomorrow, first one of the year. We'll get deeper into what Jay just went through and a couple of other things. I think there are a number of things we got to make sure we're doing as we look at this coming year. I think we got to make sure we don't have a year like we had this past year. Okay. And say even a little bit here. Tomorrow night at six. Here? No. Just yeah. so. Budget subcommittee five at six. It's not, it's not by web. I thought that was so easy. I thought it was easy. It is. According to the agenda, it's here. So I okay. know. Right. We'll right. stick to that. Okay. Okay. And okay. when okay. I was wrong. <laughs> I'm glad we went over the status. <laughs> we, may have, we may have, I think, a future policy question. Okay, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Just to keep it interesting. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. I thought I would throw that out there. All right. Um, how about our policy subcommittee? Uh, we will be meeting uh, next week on the 13th at 5 30. Nowhere. In the superintendent's <laughs> conference room in Nisco. Oh, at least she knows where she's going. Oh, okay. <laughs> for me. And the last on our list is the superintendent search committee. We just met earlier this evening. Vicki, I'm looking at you again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yep, so we met prior to our meeting tonight. Um, we discussed the invitational letter um, that was, uh, NISDEC had provided us a rough draft, so we reviewed that. We determined the application date, deadline, and um, that was shared with you all via the Google Doc. So um, we do need to uh, take a vote on that tonight so that we can then um, send that to NISDAC for them to send out. That was the first item. Um, we also discussed um, focus groups. So we came up with uh, six focus groups that will be comprised of parents, community members, teachers, administrators, uh, students, and school staff. Um, and we'll cover daytime and evening options. And we came up with two dates uh, that were uh, uh, October 25th and November 3rd. Um, there'll be a survey for people who aren't able to participate in the live focus groups, and um, that will be available to run roughly currently with the focus group date, so between like October 25th and November 4th, or maybe the 24th. Yeah, I know. It's here somewhere, but I can't yeah, see it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, that will go out in a draft press release, which I believe I also shared with everybody. Um, and that's basically it. NASDAQ has the online survey. They're going to send us the link. Um, 
And so once all the links to the, the groups, the focus groups that are set up and the survey set up, then we can send a letter out to various, the various potential participants. Um, that we do, we also discussed that we need um, IT to create a section of the district website for information on the superintendent search process that will include the timeline and such. So, um, I guess um, we can get that rolling and then I guess we'll start kind of feeding information that needs to populate that website. We also discussed reaching out to town officials, school administration, um, or teachers union reps and inviting them to join the research subcommittee. And then our next, we determined that our next meeting will be on the 18th, also at 6 p.m. prior to the next full school committee meeting. That was everything. So, for tonight, we just basically need to vote on uh, the invitational letter. Excuse me, Vicki. You said six parents, students, school staff, community members. What the other two? Uh, six groups. So um, two groups would comprise parents and community members. And so one with a daytime option, one with an evening option. Okay. Uh, one group for teachers, one group for administrators, one group for students, and one group for other staff. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so we need a motion to approve uh, our letter inviting folks to apply for the job. Motion to approve uh, the letter for um, to reach out to folks who applied for the superintendent's position. Okay. Can I just throw a do, do you want to edit real fast or do you vote this later? Um, I just want a small thing to leave something. This is on just 40 million plus. Yeah, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But we'll give it all heart attack. The revenue sheet. Okay. You're, you're confusing the way we report to the state versus the actual budget. This will be an item we'll learn more tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, you can put back in what the state level is if you want that 37 million. No, I think it's sporting the grants and all that kind of stuff. It is what it is. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, when you look at when you look at the full impact of all the revenue, the components were actually a little bit above forty. Perfect. I don't. I mean, if we can put it in whatever you want, I just, I that's what it is. It's fine. Let's, let's not. Let's not. Okay. okay. So we had a motion to approve. Do we get a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes and the letter has been approved. Any other questions or concerns related to the subcommittees? None? Okay, so we're moving on to new business. So it looks like we need to do a calendar update uh, relative to the PD, PD day and the change in date for prom. So I can speak to this uh, just to give you a little highlight. So um, we had going back, I guess it goes back to February of last year where we had an initial request for booking the prom on May 6th, and class advisors basically realized after that we already had a calendar for the 13th, and just with everything going on last year, it just never got brought forward, and then as we entered this year, and we noticed that we were starting to prepare and meet with the groups that the calendar adjustment hadn't been changed. It's fine from a PD perspective. We have not yet booked out when we think for Cheryl, she's going to take care of that. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, but we haven't quite booked. We haven't booked out our main date for PD, so it's not. It doesn't affect us anyway. We haven't booked in anyone, so it isn't. Um, it is an issue on our end to make that adjustment now. We wanted to bring forward as, as soon as we're able to. Um, that was brought to us. So it's the PD day that needs to change, and not the prom. Correct. Yes. 
So currently on our calendar, it says May 13th, and we need it to be moved to May 6th. Okay, uh, then we'll need a motion to vote to approve the calendar change. Make a motion to change the calendar to the May 13th PD day to May 6th. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, and motion passes. Uh, and the PD day has been shifted to match up with the May 6th date of prom. Um, I guess the last new business, the development is hopefully goals. I think I stole that and moved it up to my comments. So uh, if we've already done that. Uh, then any other matters not anticipated by the committee within 48 hours? Me? Yeah. So it's come to my attention over the last uh, the last few weeks that there's a lot of parents with questions around special education and, uh, and especially about the role of, of CPAC and how all the supports for special education are working. Um, I was gonna I was gonna suggest that we have something in the future that um, in the near future that that goes over all the time for all, for all the community support for, for special education and what we do as a district and all of the things that we uh, all the groups and communities and resources that those uh, parents can access for special education. So um, and I know that there's we have a director of special education. It'd be nice to see you hear from her. So one thing, um, just so you're aware, that when I met with the leadership team last week, we're starting to develop a rotation as much as we're able to, because if something comes up, we're going to bring it right away too. But have a rotation between the departments, so you're constantly hearing various updates. So um, you'll hear about teaching and learning. You'll hear about technology. You'll hear about special education so we actually have in that rotation we're starting to map that out that uh, Jen D'Angelo in the audience uh, will be coming forward at our next meeting and uh, we have some past uh, reviews and reports and evaluations we always cycle through having different evaluations of different aspects of the programming and so she can speak to that as share resources too, but um, it, on the website related to CPAC, there should be information there, and I know they've been actively uh, trying to get that up and running and meetings, and I think we have a meeting that might, is there a meeting schedule? Um, basic rights. Basic rights. Yep, yep. Yeah, so we're collaborating with the Federation this year. It's committed to our basic rights when it's best. Yeah, so uh, I think in, so, in some ways it's just getting the information out and interacting people, uh, especially new parents who might not be familiar, that's a big part of the outreach that we're trying what was the date of the meeting? You haven't said it yet. Oh, okay. But the review from. That's all done. Yeah, so that was completed last spring. Yep. Um, and then just because of all the shifting and all that, we didn't have a chance to probably present to the committee. Uh, so this summer I have that in an action plan on the recommendations. So all that will be part of the 18th. That's excellent. So October 18th, you should see that. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. But <coughs> Sean, you kind of laid a couple of things out there in the community. So, are, are which is what you're hearing that people need like a, an umbrella overview of what kind of services are available within the district? Are you looking for the kind of uh, data that Jen was just talking about coming to the next meeting? We're looking at, at, at well, all those things. All those things I'm sure will come out in in the review that Jen has. So, um, the types of questions I'm hearing about are, for instance. What are the types of supports available? So it's like basic introduction type style of information, and also, you know, what are what are the types of um, types of meetings, types of group group sessions that I can go to? Where are the where is the information that I can get at readily available? Where is it? Right. So all of this stuff is yeah. going to get covered if, if you just go through a simple overview. It is. But yeah. also, if you go through a timetable that you've been discussing already, yeah. that would be. Great. Okay. And we have some new stuff coming out this year too that I can go through. Uh, obviously last year was like the first year and we had extraordinary circumstances. So yeah, we are, yeah. we're committing to uh reconnecting with families this year. Uh, so we have some family workshops that are gonna come up and some training sessions. So I think that's another piece of it. So yeah. just giving the information actively engaging our families to be part of that. Yeah, that's excellent. that's excellent. Yeah. So family workshops, that's great. And then I, I, I know I'm, in the past we've had a problem. Going. We're working on it. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. And um, what about the coordinated review? Was it 
that will come out in our packet before the 18th. I didn't hear you. I apologize. The review, we'll get that in the um, school planning packet. Yeah, the report. report. Yep. Yeah. So last year. Yeah. I just don't think Wow. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to hijack the meeting. Uh, so last year we picked, um, so every year we pick a different area to explore. Um, so last year I identified uh, our STAR programming. So for those of you who don't know, our STAR programming our, is our um, programming for our students with autism. So we have a program at the elementary level that's housed at Memorial. We have a MISCO, and then we have one at NIM up at the high school. Um, so I contracted with an agency through some grant funding for them to come in and do a full review of the programming. They did some record review. They engaged with the faculty. Um, they talked with the staff, um, and then they came up with a full review with some recommendations. So again, the timing of that at the end of the year with everything else that everything was kind of going on and the transition. Um, we can probably present that to you um, over the summer. I was able to kind of go through it and dig a little deeper and look at where we were going to put some of those things. Some of the action steps have already happened, um, so you'll kind of hear an update of that, but you'll also hear some of the other things we're working towards that were recommended um, in that report. Okay. So that's where we are with that. Right. And you'll get a copy of the report in your packet, so you'll have that document ahead of time. So when I'm presenting, you'll, you'll have a basis of what we're going to talk about. Any other matters? Nope. Any correspondence? Okay, nope. future agenda items will be to talk about school improvement plans. And unless there's any other questions or concerns for the committee, I'll take a motion for adjournment. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we are officially adjourned at 8.20.